everybody to a Wednesday night lab. I'm Tom Zimmerman. I work here for the Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for the Division of Extension Wisconsin 4-H. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, PBS Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and W Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday night at the lab. We do this every Wednesday night, different times a year. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dan Copian. He's with the Department of Orthopedics and Rehabilitation in the School of Medicine and Public Health. He's going to speak about lower extremity biomechanics and collegiate athletes, the influence of injury. He has not yet interviewed me, <laughs> but he can so choose if he'd like. <laughs> and I'm not going to ask the five incredibly difficult questions that I ask everybody. Where were you born? River Falls, Wisconsin. Well, I, I lived on Towns Valley Road in South of Hudson yes. in okay. 1979. <laughs> Just that wow. one summer. 78. Yes, 78. Um, and where'd you go to high school? Uh, River Falls High School. Yeah. Excellent. And where'd you go for undergrad and what did you study? I went here. Uh, my majors were biology and kinesiology. Great. And where'd you go for your advanced degrees? Uh, University of Iowa uh, for my PhD, um, and then back here for a postdoc. Oh, and I went to here as well for my physical therapy degree. Forgot Great. about that one. And what was your postdoc in? Uh, basically, this neuromuscular biomechanics. Yeah. Great. And when did you uh, join the faculty? So I came back here from Iowa in 2016. So I've been back at UW Madison since then, so for the last six years. Great. Also, a wonderful pleasure to have you here. And uh, both of my knees are okay. I have two siblings who have reconstructed knees. I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Uh, everybody, if you could please join me, welcome Dan Cody on Wednesday night to All right. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for having me. Thanks to everyone for being here tonight. I'm happy to, to be here to, to give you this talk. I didn't know that those were going to be the five questions at the start, otherwise I probably wouldn't have had the background slide, which is very redundant now. Um, but yes, I am an assistant professor here in orthopedics and rehabilitation. Um, it has been, it is quite a bit of, yes, schooling to get to this point. Um, just to be clear, even though my family makes the well, my wife's family loves to make the Dr. Dr. Dan joke. I would never call myself doctor. That's confusing. I'm not a medical doctor, um, mm -hmm. but that is that is my background. So what do I really do? <laughs> well, my job is multifaceted. Uh, my job involves classroom education of our current physical therapy students. So I teach multiple courses uh, to the first year physical therapy students, as well as a number of guest lectures for the second years. I do treat patients, so I am an active clinician. I treat patients out at what used to be called the American Centers, now the East Madison Hospital, um, almost out in Sun Prairie on the, the east side, but I work in sports rehab there. I'm there about one day a week. I This is more the research uh, uh, aspects of my job, which is, I guess I'd say the majority by time. So designing research studies, collecting data, analyzing that data, and then trying to distribute the results through presentations and various publications. Um, and then from also a clinical or kind of a combination of clinical and research perspective, I would say I, I have a consulta uh, consultatory role as well, primarily with UW Athletics. So I work with some of our UW athletes, but I'm, I'd say, a little bit more oversight, kind of providing information to try to provide our, our athletes with the best care. But just from a time perspective, I'm not necessarily the one working one on one with them the most. Occasionally pose for pictures. Apologies for the Iowa logo. That was a very old pose for picture. I need to get all my pictures retaken. Uh, but essentially, my, my job comes down to these three pillars of research, teaching, and clinical practice. Um, and honestly, when, when things are, are good, they all work together. You know, they all, they all work together really well. You know, the idea is in clinic, you know, I'm seeing patients. I'm, I'm seeing patients with injuries or, um, you know, various, um, uh, various physical issues and asking the questions, why does that happen? Why did this patient recover much faster than that patient? What is keeping this patient from fully recovering? Why does this injury keep happening? Those types of questions. 
then you can take those questions, go to the lab, you know, and design your research investigations, try to answer some of those questions. And then I get to bring that information to our new students, right? And the idea of kind of carrying that information forward and then hoping that, you know, some of them will, will you know, take up those things as well and kind of keep moving the field forward. So it is, yeah, I feel a real nice combination of, of things that, that makes up my, my position here. So my area of research, clinical expertise, lower extremity biomechanics and neuromuscular performance. And that's about as, you know, as, as short as I can say it, right? The, the, the goal is always to make it, you know, make the paragraph as long as possible, um, but that is about as short as I can say it. So what does that really mean? How people move and how their muscles function, right? And, and the interplay between those two things, basically the muscles that drive human movement and how that relates to, in the case of injury, illness, and disuse, the challenges that we see from a physical therapy perspective. So this is kind of what I'm going to you know, start with talking about tonight, biomechanics of human movement, you know, as, as basic as that is, is just how, how people move, right? And from my perspective as a physical therapist, I'm mostly interested in that, you know, that first bullet point there, the analysis of pathological movement. Would you be able to move that? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I can. I didn't even see that there. There's an answer right on. That one. Sure. Yes. <laughs> there we go. Good call. How's that? A little better. All right. Thanks. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, so, primary, my primary interest as a physical therapist is pathological movement, right? How injury, illness, and disuse change how people move, the things that we see, and then why that occurs, right? So, we can define what we're seeing but really want to go to the next step too and say, why is that happening? Because that gives us an opportunity to treat those things and try to resolve those deficits or deficiencies. So those are kind of the, the three concepts I'll try to take us through tonight. You know, what, what we're seeing, why we think we're seeing it, not everything, some examples, um, and then some ideas for, for how we can work to resolve certain things that we see. So the what, um, that, that first bullet point there, basically the, the term we use for this is kinematics and that's motion. The, that word basically means motion or movement independent of forces or causes. And so when we say we're interested in the kinematics, it's like, you know, my, my elbow is moving, my elbow is flexing, it's flexing through a range of motion. Now it's extending through a range of motion. The normal amount of flexion or extension I should have at my elbow is 150 degrees. And so that's kind of the, from a kinematic standpoint. Now, in terms of the, you know, the, the motion at each of our joints at our, as our uh, bodies function, what we like to say is that structure dictates, fun dictates function. So basically the anatomical shape of our joints dictates what types of movement or how much movement is available at each joint. So in order to study these things, we try to, let's say, provide a framework uh, and characterize the different joints or the types of shapes that make up the human body. So you know, we've all heard of this, right? We have ball and socket joints, right? And obviously the example for that is your, is your, you know, your shoulder, your hip, Those are ball and socket joints. There's a lot of movement available. There's triplanar movement. You can, you know, you can flex in my shoulder. I can flex and extend. I can have an adduct and then I can rotate, right? There's a lot of movement available. Now, I say it's a framework because that's really not all that accurate. You know, if we're really looking at the shape of your humerus and your glenoid that it sits against, it's more like a golf ball sitting against a quarter. There's really not much of a cup at all there. Um, there's actually quite a bit of instability there. That's why people have so many shoulder injuries, right? Is it's not a very tight joint at all. So again, it's really kind of a, of a framework. It's not a perfect characterization, but it helps us study these things and it helps us to be able to say, you know, hey, the shoulder is a, is a joint. You should have motion in three planes. The elbow, which would be a hinge joint or part of the elbow as a hinge joint, is a pretty stable joint. You should really only have motion in, in one plane, right? You should really only be able to, to flex and extend at the elbow there. And so that's, I guess I'd say, kind of how we, how we characterize those things. And, and that helps us study the types of, of motions or movements that are available. So how do we do this in the lab setting? Well, the gold standard for this and what we use in our lab is 3D motion analysis. So I, uh, I don't know if people have ever seen this. <laughs> the, 
the, the description I always give to people is if you've seen how video games are made, <laughs> I'm not sure how many of you have seen that, but what they typically do to try to capture how somebody moves, if they're making a video game with pro athletes or something like that, is they'll have them wear a suit that's covered with these little retro reflective markers. And that way they can really capture that person's movements. You know, they can get exactly how that person moves into the game. And that's essentially the, you know, that comes from science, right? That comes from these types of investigations. That's how that technology was used initially. And that's how it continues to be used today. But basically what we do is we cover someone's body with these little retro reflective markers on key landmarks. And then we can use the position of those markers to basically build a model that allows us to quantify the motion that occurs at each joint. So here's, this is a little bit of an example from one of our older labs, but here's an example of an individual who is running on a treadmill. They are fully outfitted with the markers. You know, they are small, they are hard to fully see there. But then that second image shows the, the model on the computer screen, right? We can see all of those markers moving and we can build a skeletal model on the far right based on the position of all those markers. Yeah. So that's basically how we can do such things. And then we can calculate the movement at each joint. So those graphics at the bottom show the hip and knee motion throughout a gait cycle, right? As someone is, is running on a treadmill. Um, and not, you know, I won't get into too much detail. They're not too important, but what we're looking at, we're looking at two different colored lines for two different limbs, right? So the fact that they're almost the same tells us that that person is very symmetrical. That's a healthy individual, right? They have symmetrical movement of their hip and knee or their hips and knees as they're running on the treadmill. Okay? So that's, that's just the, the motion analysis aspect of it. Then we get into the, the to the uh, to the why, right? Which is the forces. So that the study of forces or the effect of forces on the body is kinetics, yeah? and all of those forces are forces that produce, stop, or modify movement. And what we're really interested in, right, is the influence of these forces on motion. Now it can be forces, you know, internal or external to the body. But from my standpoint, again, as a physical therapist, what we're primarily interested in is the muscle forces, right? Because that's what drives human movement. Um, and those are often our targets for physical therapy intervention because people have muscular weakness as a result of injury, illness, disuse. So those give us targets to be able to improve people's function. So that's kind of where my interest is there. So how do we combine these two things? <laughs> and uh, and try, really try to avoid putting these kind of graphics in here. I just don't think they're that, that effective. So I promise there won't be many more. Um, but it's, it's the best kind of description for this I could find. What we're really doing is we're combining that motion data that we get from the 3D motion analysis with forces that we can collect from uh, force plates. Basically, our treadmill is instrumented. So when you step onto the treadmill, we get or we can capture a ground reaction force. So equal and opposite force. I'm putting force onto the belt or into the floor, and we get a force vector as a result of that. So we combine those two pieces of information to kind of estimate the forces at each one of the joints as someone is running. So what this graphic is showing is that it's really a, it's, it's called an inverse dynamics approach. It's, it's like a backwards approach. You're working backwards to determine the cause of the motion. You're starting with the movement patterns and you're measuring the amount of movement in each joint and you're measuring the forces. And then you're basically estimating what the muscle forces or the muscle torques are at each joint that, that uh, dictate that movement. So that's kind of a, a graphic of what that looks like. So now, same type of example, here's a model with the 3D motion capture markers. And now you can see the ground reaction forces in this video. So each of those, the blue vectors that are rising as the foot is hitting the ground, that's the ground reaction force. Yeah. So that's the, the kinetic data that we're combining with the the motion data to, to try to quantify things at each joint. So again, from this, we're taking the kinematic or the motion data, hip and the knee, like we just looked at at the last slide. And then we're taking the next step, combining that with the ground reaction force data to calculate the kinetics, which is basically the joint torques or the muscle forces at each one of the joints. So this example is someone who is not a healthy individual. I mean, you can clearly see the lines are not symmetrical, both for the motion and for the forces. 
right? This is someone who is coming off of a, a knee surgery. So we see a significant difference in the amount of, of knee flexion motion during the stance phase. And unsurprisingly, there's a big difference in the muscle forces at that joint. So now kind of take a step back and, and describe our lab and, and position a little bit, and then try to kind of take that forward with examples of specific injuries that we see and, and you know, how those, those movement mechanics are different. So the lab that I'm part of is Badger Athletic Performance. Um, and this is a joint venture between orthopedics and rehabilitation and uh, University of Wisconsin Athletics. And basically the idea is to combine these two aspects, kind of combine the research arm or the academic arm of ortho rehab with that, that D1 athletics. And the, the mission statement basically is shown there is to try to maximize at the individual level, each student athlete's health and wellness. And that's the idea. We're collecting data, we're collecting information from our student athletes. And then we're giving that, we're, we're kind of providing let's say, uh, usable information based on what we take to help improve either athletic performance or help facilitate recovery from injury and illness. Uh, so that's basically kind of how things work in that, that realm. The lab director is Brian Heiderscheidt. He's also a professor in ortho rehab um, and has, has been at University of Wisconsin for, for quite some time and has worked very hard to kind of establish this. Took, a, took quite a while for this to really happen, right? To kind of marry these, these two areas. Um, but now that we, you know, we, that we have things, it's really a, it's, it's really a, a unique pairing, I guess I would say. Um, there are a lot of other Big Ten schools that are trying to do this, um, but it can be very challenging to kind of get all the teams on board. Oftentimes people have a relationship with maybe one team based on the coaches or something like that, but to have kind of all of athletics on board is, is I'd say what makes it, makes us pretty unique or makes Wisconsin's version of this pretty unique. Yeah. All right, so the injury that I'm gonna be starting to talk about or kind of using as a, as a uh, example of some of the things we see is, is ACL injury. So anterior cruciate ligament injury. Anterior cruciate ligament is a stabilizing central ligament in the knee. Yeah? And it is you know, something, if you, you know, are watching sports or something like that, it's something you would definitely hear about because it's a very common injury in athletics. The mechanism of injury of the anterior cruciate ligament is typically rotation on a fixed or, or planted foot. Um, oftentimes this is opposite rotational directions between the thigh and, and the shank or the thigh and the shin. And so we see the graphic there and then you can see the um, some uh, a soccer players lean in a very similar position, right? So that gives an example of how that injury can occur. So common ways that that injury occurs are somebody planting, cutting, trying to decelerate or stop their motion, landing from a jump. Now, you can also tear your ACL stepping off the curb, <laughs> but it's less common. It's just not as high, you know, high energy of a, of a task. So usually we're seeing this in, in uh, sporting events. Okay? Sports that have a high incidence of this injury, obviously men's and women's soccer, football, basketball and volleyball, those tend to be some of the, the highest incidence uh, of injury for this this particular one. Typical standard of care, at least in this country, for ACL injury or ACL rupture is surgical reconstruction. Okay? So it's not necessarily repair of the ligament, right? But once the ligament is torn, it's not like suturing or trying to bridge both ends back together, although there are technologies in place to, to try to do that. Um, but reconstruction is actually using some other tissue from the body to let's say kind of replace that ligament or create a new ligament. So this graphic just shows a few, and, and not in great detail, but shows a few of those options. Basically the primary options are taking part of your patella tendon just below the patella, taking part of your quad tendon just above the patella, or taking part of your hamstring tendon right here. Okay? So either way, we're, we're kind of borrowing <laughs> from somewhere else in the body to reestablish the stability of the ligament and kind of recreate that, that, uh, that stability. This is the reason why we have, you know, why we study the ACL injury or study ACL injury and surgery so much. It's just, it's, it's not that common, but it's common enough um, that when it happens, it can be a very devastating injury, both for an individual athlete and, you know, from a, from a team standpoint, if we're talking about 
um, you know, a, an athlete that is, is very crucial to their team's success. It's a lengthy rehab. It's a really long recovery. Um, the previous standard used to be kind of return to play in six months, but people kept getting hurt going back to sport. And so that was kind of extended. I would say the current standard is more like nine months to a year. And it's pretty well recognized that even in that first year after returning, people aren't really 100%. They're back, but they're not necessarily at their previous level of performance. So the current thinking is that it may even be really a two-year injury to get fully back to where you are. Well, think about a collegiate athlete's career. It's short, right? I mean, it's four years at most, well, maybe five, well, maybe six COVID. Um, but, uh, you know, it's not, it's not long, right? I mean, that's a, that's a significant amount of time. If you're suffering that injury in your second year or whatever, what do you have, one year left when you return? So it's, it's really devastating from an athlete's perspective. Um, and then long-term sequelae, uh, we know that if you have an ACL rupture, your chances of OA, chances of osteoarthritis in that joint drastically increase. I mean, even five, 10, 15 years after the injury. I mean, if you're having that, you know, we've seen people where you have the injury and you're, you know, when you're 20 and by, you know, 25 or so, your, your knee is really not in great shape. Um, and that's a problem, right? I mean, that's a really early time period for that joint degeneration to start. So kind of the idea is not only can we, you know, how can we help people return to sport better in the short term, but how can we maximize long-term joint health? Um, is kind of the idea with an injury like this. So I'd say that's why it's kind of such a common, you know, thing that is studied and such a common target of, of intervention in my field because of, of all these factors. So, you know, it's actually, actually uh, getting into the biomechanics aspect. So let's take a look at one of our University of Wisconsin student athletes running on our treadmill after an ACL reconstruction. I wanna say this was four to six months after uh, ACL reconstruction for this athlete is a women's track athlete. And here she is running on the treadmill and I wanna say this was a, I have to do the conversion. We do everything in meters per second. I can't remember what the exact miles, miles an hour is. I wanna say it's like an eight minute mile or seven or eight minute mile. Um, so not, not this athlete's maximum speed by any means, but, you know, a, a reasonable speed if they were you know, running for distance. Okay. So here's the question. Is the athlete running normally? <laughs> Can you tell? <laughs> I mean, they're running, uh, you know, hard to say, especially with, you know, about prior experience or whatever in this, but even at, for me at full speed, I really have to look pretty close, you know, to say, am I seeing a difference there or not just by the, by the visual? So in our lab, we do a very detailed set of assessments. We do assessments of muscle function. We, we, we measure, quantify um, muscle activity through, through different sensors on the skin. We measure their movement biomechanics when they're running, when they're jumping, when they're hopping on one leg. And basically, here's the way I can put it. <laughs> the closer you look, or this is what we found, the closer you look, the more you find, or the more abnormalities you find. Um, just looking at that video on the last slide, it's like, yeah, she's running. You know, it looks okay. It's fairly smooth, you know, but when you really start measuring these things, it's, it's kind of shocking just how abnormal or how asymmetrical some of these individuals are when they're moving or when they're performing these athletic tasks after an ACL reconstruction. So let's take a look at another example and kind of work through this. And now we slowed it down much easier. So we always, always film in slow motion. Um, this is a men's wrestling athlete, same, you know, injury, I don't want to say this four months after surgery or so. So I want to, I'll, I'll uh, give you the, the hint now. So the right leg is the involved leg for this individual. The left leg was the healthy leg. So what do you see as the difference there? If we're just, if I freeze it in mid stance like that, what are we seeing as the difference? Some of the easiest ways to try to detect this, or you try to point this out by the eye is the height of the waistband. So that helps because our, you know, for our images here, we have a very clear distinction there, right? If someone was wearing a long t-shirt or clothes, that obviously that would be difficult. Um, but that gives us a clear indication there. The other thing would be the height of the head or shoulders, right? We can clearly see almost the same point of mid stance on the left leg. We can see almost half of the athletes, you know, almost to the nose. And on the right leg, you know, we're barely getting to the bottom of the chin. So clearly, you know, that on the healthy leg, the athlete is, you know, the whole center of mass is dropping down further than what we're seeing on the injured side. Okay. 
And again, we can measure this. That is exactly what we're doing. Obviously, we see they're, they're wearing the, the 3D motion capture markers. So here's what we see kind of characteristically after these types of injuries. When people run, they do so with reduced knee flexion angles. As a result, the hip is in a more extended position or a more straighter position there, and they have less ankle dorsiflexion. Um, at the ankle, this motion is referred to as dorsiflexion. So less dorsiflexion just basically means less, you know, a straighter angle at the ankle. So, I, so basically the way I can describe all three of these is just, it, it's, it's like a stiffer landing, right? There's just less motion at each one of these three joints. Okay? How much less? The knee is flexing for this individual about nine degrees less on average. The hip, not a huge change. The ankle also about nine degrees less on average. Okay, So that may sound like a you know relatively small amount, um, but when we come back to what normal is, we'll see that that is kind of far outside those ranges. All right, so back to the women's track athlete that we looked at at full speed. Now here she is in slow speed. Now, can you pick it out having seen <laughs> the, uh, the key on the last slide? Is it left or right? Which leg is she not sinking as much on? If you said left, that is accurate. Left leg is the involved leg. Right leg is the healthy leg. For this individual, same pattern, far uh, worse, <laughs> far more asymmetrical. She's almost a 20 degree difference in how much she's flexing or bending that knee, 15 degree difference at the ankle and six degree difference at the hip. So the interesting thing, and this is honestly like I coming out of my PhD, I did more of the neuromuscular, like a muscle function stuff. We did some of this, but not this much. And honestly, this has been really interesting to me. What we've seen is that across almost all of our athletes, all of our sports, this pattern holds. Athletes of different shapes and sizes. This is a women's soccer player. It's the same exact pattern, okay? Same pattern. Again, this is about six months post-surgery. You said left leg for that one, you'd be correct. Men's football players, the tight end, very, you know, much heavier, much larger individual, different running characteristics, you know, different running stride, very similar pattern, right? It's almost identical if we go through and measure each of those things, the changes that are occurring. You said right leg for that one, that would be accurate. Women's basketball player, very, again, different uh, shape and size of the athlete, different type of running stride. This person is much more upright. Again, if we said, you know, which leg is it happening on here, it would be the right leg that's the involved leg for this individual. Okay? So again, kind of regardless of some of those other characteristics, the same pattern persists. Okay? So here's kind of some of the big questions that we get or some of the things people always you know, say when we start talking about this. Does this vary by foot strike pattern? Right. Oftentimes people are like, oh, that's because they're heel strikers. If they just ran with a four foot strike, you know, if they ran on their toes, then that wouldn't happen. Well, that's not the case. <laughs> it's, we see no difference regardless of foot strike pattern. That's how that track athlete ran. She was more of a four foot striker and there's no difference there. They vary by sport or positional demands. We just talked about this, absolutely not. That seems to be you know, the case no matter what. This is an interesting one. And this is kind of relates to the difficulties uh, sometimes of you know, getting to where we are today. Um, I showed you the wrestler. Uh, initially, we had, you know, a sport like wrestling, uh, sometimes the feedback we got was wrestlers don't run, it doesn't matter, you know, like, what does it matter? Wrestlers, why are we even looking at this? They don't run, you know, in their sport, that's not part of their sport. Like, yeah, that's not part of their sport, but the way they do run relates to how they perform other movements, right? We're not necessarily always just using this as, you know, to help them run better, it's kind of, uh, a, a, provides insight into everything they do. But running is easy to measure and you know we can we can uh, get some pretty good information from that this is a key one is this how these athletes have always run right people will be like well maybe that's how they always ran maybe they were just always asymmetrical like that um and the answer is definitely no uh phd student from our lab keith kinner led a really interesting project on this we had enough data in healthy athletes who went on to have an acl injury that we were able to to study this like pre-post in those specific individuals so we had about 15 people who we had healthy data on, and actually that track athlete was one of them, before they, they got injured. And when you compare in the same individuals before their injury, after the surgery, it's very different. Are these asymmetries within the normal ranges of between limb variation? That's the key one, right? Like, so what, is it, is it a problem, right? Is this, is this abnormal, is this unusual what we're seeing? And obviously the answer is no, this is far outside of the normal ranges. 
So I showed you the, the woman track athlete. Here's kind of her asymmetries. Again, the, the 6, 20, and 14. These are the normal between limb variations in the peak knee, hip, and ankle flexion angles in our healthy athletes. So if we take a large volume of our healthy athletes across all sports and study this, this is like the 90, 95% of all athletes will be plus or minus two and a half or 2.3 degrees difference at the knee. Like one, you know, one leg might be two degrees greater, the other might be, might be two degrees greater or less, 95% of all athletes. So what we're seeing here, or even like the 10 degree difference at the knee is far outside of the normal ranges. Okay? All right, now to the forces. Um, this is a radar plot. I try to use a graphic like this to kind of illustrate the comparison between our ACLs and the healthy athletes. I think this is a, a reasonably good way of trying to, to visualize this or show this. So what we have here is a you know, triangle shape. At each uh, end of the triangle we have, on the top we have knee extensor forces or basically the forces at the knee. On the bottom right, we have the ankle. On the bottom left, we have the, the hip. Okay? That orange band represents healthy, represents healthy athletes, right? Like we said, there's variation, right? Sometimes people have a little bit you know, more force in the knee on this leg than this leg. So basically, if we're looking at the knee, the normal ranges are 87 to 113% for the knee extensor impulse. Okay, So that's kind of where that band is, right? So the question is, where do our ACL athletes fall, you know, on this triangle. That's what the shape looks like at six months post-surgery. That's what that triangle would look like for our ACL athletes. So what we see is a, a real significant difference at the knee. We do see a significant difference even at the ankle. It's not much, but there is a significant difference there. And then at the hip, we actually see a greater uh, uh, asymmetry, meaning they are loading their involved hip to a greater extent. They're actually shifting load from the knee to the hip. How about at nine months? I said that was kind of the time of normal return to sport. What do they look like at nine months? That's eh, not a lot better. That's not great, <laughs> right? That's not really what we'd like to see in terms of people going back to sport with that level of asymmetry. Now the ankle is at least normal, but we still see a big difference at the knee and the hip really is unchanged. 13 months post-surgery, okay? Even over a year post-surgery. Yeah, it's a little bit closer, but it's not there yet. And it's really not, again, where we would like it to be. It's certainly not within normal ranges. The hip is still asymmetrical and the knee is clearly asymmetrical. So the average knee extensor impulse, 13 months post-surgery is 73%. And I said, we wanna be between 87 and 113. And the average hip is 110. And for that one, we'd wanna be, I wanna say it's 93 to 107, okay? So it's outside the normal ranges for both of those. This was a, you know, a combined data across 17 athletes. Of those 17 athletes at over a year post-surgery, only three of the 17 were normal, basically for all three motions, okay? So I guess that kind of tells you like our success, right? It's not great, right? Only three of 17 at 13 months post-surgery are running with normal lower extremity biomechanics. Okay, this is kind of the, you know, sometimes these are the favorite slides. Well, so what? You know, like they can run, right? What does it matter if it's asymmetrical? Like they can run, they can run fast, right? That, that track athlete was back at her sport at nine months post-surgery and set some new personal bests for her, her event. That's kind of crazy. Like, that's really interesting. Um, the ACL itself is an innervated ligament. It's vascular. It provides the body or the brain information about the joint position or the position sense of the knee. When you take that out of the system, would we really expect it to be normal, right? Is that even a reasonable expectation that we could possibly reestablish symmetry in that way? I, I don't know the full answer to that question. Here's the current understanding or the way that we currently approach it. Does running with those mechanics create an injury risk, right? Is that a problem? Is that bad? In the short term, I would say probably not directly. Like just running straight line running with an asymmetry like that, I'm not sure you're at any greater risk for injury. But if you try to stop quickly, if you try to land from a jump, if you, you know, if you make contact with, a, with an opposing player, that may be different. Now you're going to land with an extended knee position. That's an increased risk for ACL injury. The other issue is long term, right? talked about the potential risk of people going down that road of osteoarthritis when they have an ACL injury. That's really that kind of key factor. When you're moving abnormally like that, when you're loading the joint abnormally, 
is that a, a big risk factor for, for setting someone down that road? That's really my concern. I really don't, at this point anyway, like, I really don't want to set someone up to have that like five years later, hey, your knee is in terrible shape, right? You've got, you've got significant joint degeneration at that point. We're starting to see more and more studies like this. Um, abnormal biomechanics at six months post-surgery are associated with cartilage degeneration three years later, right? Which is really interesting, right? The idea that, hey, even six months after surgery, if you're just loading that knee abnormally a ton, you're setting yourself up, you know, for those, those joint degeneration changes to take place. Um, so I guess I'd say like best current evidence suggests we should attempt at least to bring people back into those normal ranges to, yes, improve performance in the short term, but more uh, promote long-term knee joint health. All right, so why is this happening? <laughs> um, let's look at a scatter plot of the running knee kinetics and time from surgery. So on the x-axis, on the bottom here, we have months post-surgery. On the y-axis, we have that knee extensor impulse symmetry, okay? Here's that normal, I said 87 to 113%. That's that normal range of between limb asymmetry there, okay? So what we can clearly see, there's maybe some relationship here, but it's not the whole story, okay? Like there's something there, but it, it's, you know, it's explaining a very small percent of what we're seeing. And frankly, that's a good thing. If it was just time from surgery, I don't know, there's much we can do about it, right? If it was like, hey, well, you just gotta wait three years and then, then you know, things will resolve. Well, okay, that's, you know, again, not, not great to think that there's you know, nothing that we can affect there. Um, so time plays maybe a small role, but not a huge role. So let's take a look at a little bit more information, kind of bringing the neuromuscular aspect into this. Now you're seeing patient running or athlete running on the treadmill. You're seeing a different kind of data. What you're seeing there is the signals of a uh, surface electromyography. So what it is, is they're small sensors that we place over the muscle bellies of the thigh and of the legs that give us information about when the muscles are active, when the muscles are firing. Okay. So these are placed on one of the quadriceps muscles, one of the, the muscles on the front of the thigh for both legs for this individual. So what you can see basically is when they're landing on that leg, on, 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 right? The muscle is firing as they're putting weight through that leg and then it turns off when they're, when they're um, in, in stride, when they're, uh, when they're in swing phase, okay? So we can clearly see that that muscle is active and we can quantify the amount of torque that is produced at that joint, right? This is the result of that inverse dynamics approach. This is the knee joint moment or the, the knee extensor torque that's generated when someone's landing on the leg like that. So here's the big question. Does your patient have the ability to generate or does the athlete have the ability to generate that necessary knee extension torque? Well, as, um, as it turns out, Quadriceps neuromuscular dysfunction is ubiquitous. It is, it is a hallmark of ACL injury and surgery. Any knee injury that occurs, um, we see a kind of a, an immediate, let's say, protective shutdown of the quadriceps. There's definitely a, a lack or a, a limited ability for your brain to fire the muscle early on. And that seems to persist. In addition, we see a significant amount of atrophy of that muscle group. So there are four heads or four portions of the quadriceps muscle and combined the muscle volume there is the largest muscle group in the body by volume. So that alone gives it you know, some functional importance or functional relevance. Okay? But what we see consistently is that quadriceps muscle function is, is, is altered, it's abnormal, it's affected by these types of injuries and surgery. I mean, there's an individual post-surgery Obviously, you can, you can tell which leg is the, you know, the uninjured leg just based on the size and volume of the quadriceps muscle. Now, compared to the injured leg, you know, it looks like it's almost half the size, right? And it's not unusual. Big difference there. And what we have seen is that quadriceps function is related to a lot of these uh, abnormalities that we see. So our data, okay, another scatter plot, not to show, show any more of these. Um, but now on the x-axis, we have quadricep strength symmetry. So ideally 100%, okay? We can see it runs from kind of 20 to 120%. Ideally, most people, you know, most healthy individuals would be at 100 plus or minus 10%. On the y-axis, we once again have that knee extensor uh, impulse symmetry during running, okay? 
So this is something like 120 of our athlete collections from four months to two years post-surgery. So that's that normal band, right? That band represents typical between limb symmetry and healthy control athletes. So clearly not many of the dots in that band, right? It's about 10 to 12% of every, of all of our collections that end up in that band for our post-ACL athletes. Now, is there a relationship here? Yeah, there's some relationship, right? We can clearly, it's a stronger relationship than the time from surgery and the running, uh, the running the extensor impulse. So there's something there. If we look at our, our R squared value, basically the quad strength would explain something like 35% of the variance in that running the extensor impulse. So there's definitely something there. Um, increased quad strength symmetry equals increased running knee kinetic symmetry. That is true. However, we do see that there are a number of athletes who seem to have pretty good quad strength, but still don't have great running knee kinetic symmetry, right? This idea is kind of like, well, why is that happening? It's not, again, once again, it's not telling us the whole story. There's something there that's not telling us the whole story. So the two pieces of information that I take from this, you know, one, people with better quad strength move with more normal or symmetrical mechanics. But two, even with the restoration of that, that uh, peak quad strength, abnormal movement mechanics can persist. Okay? So the next question is, all right, so now bringing it back to the clinical aspect, as physical therapists, how do we attempt to resolve these abnormalities, right? How do we attempt to address these things? And the answer to that is, it depends on the cause. This is the great, this is the, my students, you know, you ask a question in class, if someone doesn't know the answer, they're like, well, it depends. And then, you know, I can't be like, well, that's wrong because, you know, there's something right about that, but it's, it's kind of the go-to answer in, in our classes. Um, but it's, in this case, it's true, right? It really does depend on the cause. So I'm gonna, you know, again, bring up the scatter plot here. For these individuals, what do these individuals need, right? If I was looking at one of these, if I was seeing one of these people as a patient, these people need better quad strength, right? That's what they, they're all below 60% for that quad LSI, okay? So if, we, if I was just watching them run and they're running, you know, with this big abnormality, um, I, I can't say like, hey, can you, uh, can you bend your knee when you run? You know, I can't just ask them to do that because their body, they can't, they physically can't do it. They can't generate enough torque here to absorb the impact of landing. Okay? So it's a losing game. I can't ask them to do that and, and get that to happen. These individuals, something else, right? There might be something else going on. They have reasonably good quad strength, but you know, maybe they need something else. Maybe we need to work with them to train their running mechanics. You know, to have them go through different drills, maybe get real time feedback of how they're running, or maybe we need to, you know, address some other aspects of the system to allow them to run symmetrically. In a little woodpecker sound in this plan if you're trying oh, yeah. to figure out. Sorry. If, uh, I've never had a woodpecker before. <laughs> I, didn't, it's, it's, I didn't bring it's you only in the Zoom, it's not in the house. <laughs> So, uh, no worries. Just trying to figure it out. I don't usually stand here and stare at people. I mean, <laughs> wouldn't be the first. All right. So, no worries. So I'll give you an example, right, of of what I will call individualized treatment. Because we like, you know, we use this information on the group level, right? Again, on the group level, we can say, hey, if you have better quad strength, you know, you're going to run more symmetrically. But that doesn't help the person who's way over on the right side, right? Who has 100% quad LSI and still runs asymmetrically. But they already have that. Then we're not doing them any favors, not really addressing their, their deficiencies. So this is an example of individualized treatment. This is a data from a college soccer player, one of our collegiate men's soccer players, five months post ACL reconstruction. This individual's quad strength symmetry is 88%. So again, not to get too far into this, we're basically on the right, we're just looking at their ability to generate quadriceps muscle force, basically. When we measure it, they're almost symmetrical, about 10% different, which again is right on the edge of those normal between limb ranges, right? I said, you know, 100 plus or minus 10%. At five months plus surgery, that's great. That'd be much better than our average. Our average at that time is, you know, maybe only like 60% or so. So that's really good. However, when we ask this individual to try to produce quadriceps force quickly, we see a very different picture. So now if we're trying to, to kind of quantify their ability to generate force quickly, we, we kind of sometimes call this power. It's not really that, but that's the way to think of it. We might look at the slope of that torque time curve. And we now, if we look at the slope, we can see there's a big difference there, 
um, and looking at our muscle activation data, we see on their involved limb, they can't fire the muscle quickly. Okay? So why is that important? Well, when people are running, it happens pretty fast. There's, pretty, there's a very small amount of time available for them to develop force. It, that stance phase, when the, you know, the foot hits the ground and the muscle is active and then the foot's off, that happens in about a tenth of a second. I mean, it's like that, 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 that. So it's not just that the muscle needs to be strong, but you need to be able to turn it on and off quickly. Okay? So those are two kind of different aspects of, of the muscle function. Okay? So that's something that we can kind of address differently. If we were trying to make someone strong, we'd give them a certain type of intervention or exercises. If we we're trying to make them faster and more powerful, we'd train them a different way. So these are the types of exercises that we're prescribing to this individual. Basically, it's our typical, let's say, lower extremity strengthening type exercises, but the way the athlete does them are different. So he's doing a lunge with a quick or rapid pushback to standing. It's a seated knee extension exercise, but again, the, the command are to try to extend the knee as quick as you can. Okay? And we can use a variety of loads. If we use low loads, they'll move faster, get more velocity. If they use high loads, Get more powerful. Okay? Same type of action now with the leg press. Again, they can go, you know, go down with control and then push up as fast and as hard as they can. So we're all working on the ability to fire the muscle quickly. And for this individual, that's going to be very beneficial. So now let's go back and kind of you know, look at the results. So this is the initial uh, uh, initial data after three months of training that was kind of focused more on this rapid or powerful contractions. That's the improvement we see. Okay? So at that point, you know, he has almost no asymmetry in that, that rapid activation or a significant improvement in that symmetry. And, you know, unsurprisingly, we see more symmetrical movement mechanics because again, we are addressing the factors that are preventing them from moving normally. Okay? But for a different individual, I wouldn't say that's the best choice, right? I may have another individual who has, you know, a, um, strength and power symmetry that are about the same. Well, then they don't just need the fast contractions, they need both, right? They need strength and power. So you're kind of trying to combine those things on the individual level. Um, not to, to go into other things too far as was, I was debating whether to cut the slide or not, um, but one last, you know, in the, just kind of example, everything that I've showed so far is knee. Um, and, I, and I will be clear that, you know, most of what we do in our lab is lower extremity. Most labs, biomechanics labs are either lower or upper extremity. It's like you almost never see both in the same lab. And I think it just has to do with like the training, you know, the training that you go through. Some train kind of more from the lower extremity standpoint. They don't get into the upper extremity. That's almost always what you see. But we do more than just knee injury. Obviously, we look at, we've seen a lot more hip surgeries lately. So that is something that we're evaluating as well. We see Achilles repairs, we see ankle surgeries as well. So we are, you know, we do, we are collecting that data as well and kind of looking at that. And the point I just want to make is that, you know, each one of these injuries are different, right? When we look at someone who's had a hip arthroscopy and look at their running mechanics, we see very different things. We don't see these differences at the knee. That makes sense, right? But what we do see is changes in how much they can extend their hip during the swing phase. So now it's more of a kinematic change. It's really not necessarily the force changes that we're seeing, we're seeing more of the motion changes. Okay? So again, that relates to maybe our interventions for this person. Maybe they don't need strengthening or, power, or that kind of muscle uh, um, exercise, they need stretching. Okay? It's a little bit different depending on the type of, type of injury. All right, so hopefully that's reasonably on time um that's kind of wraps up what i had to share here tonight um but you know basically kind of in summary and obviously it's not just us you know we're learning from all the other groups that are that have done these types of things in the past and that are doing these going forward um but that ultimate goal is to you know to better understand how the body responds to injury and then the things that we can do right to help individuals to help people on an individual level to return to the activities that they want to participate in, live healthy and happy lives, and then you know long term try to preserve their joint health. So that's that's all I got. Um, but thanks very much. I'm happy to take any questions if there's time for that. I feel like I usually take all the time. Thank you.
you're doing uh, physical therapy assessments at the hospital in that side of your occupation. You don't get nearly this kind of build up, right? Great question. So, yeah, sure. The, the question is basically if, you know, comparing what we can do in the lab setting, badger athletic performance, to what we can do in a normal clinical setting, like out at the, the, the physical therapy clinic I'm working at, you know, that we don't necessarily get the same kinds of information. And that, that is absolutely true. The, that clinic um, is probably more advanced than most. We do have some, some nice technology out there. There is actually a motion capture lab out there. It's just not feasible to use it clinically from a time standpoint, right? Like I can't necessarily take the hour and a half or whatever it takes, you know, to do a full collection on a patient every time. So one of the things that we try to do with the lab data, with the, the BAP data, is to find um, relationships that can better inform clinical care. Like, for example, can we just doing that slow motion filming, can we reasonably identify if we're being very specific with giving people cues of like how to do it? Can people identify, you know, when someone is really asymmetrical versus a little bit asymmetrical versus relatively normal? So that is the idea of trying to bring things to that. But I mean, it's absolutely a point that, yeah, you can't do all of that from a clinical perspective. What's the reason for what's the theory for why the quads, why the why the quad of uh, the, the quad atrophies yeah. associated with a, a surgery on the knee itself? Yeah, it's a great question. So there's this happens kind of in stages, is, is part of the problem because the initial injury causes this kind of shutdown, and then the surgery is like a second trauma. So somebody is as an athlete, they're in a trained state. Right, like they're always the training of just being in their sport or training, so their their system is kind of um, optimized. Right, they have a higher level of strength, or whatever. Once they get injured, well, they stop training. Right, or this type of injury, at least they're not running, cutting, jumping. Maybe they can do some weight room stuff, but they're not doing much. So now you're just removing the training load. So just just removing that is going to cause their function to drop. And then specific to the quad. In some ways, the reason that originally happens or initially happened, we think, is more of a, like the body's protective mechanism, because the quad, when it contracts, it does create a, you know, forces at the knee joint, right? It does create shear forces or compressive forces at the knee. So the thought is that that's kind of like initial protective mechanism, but then for reasons we don't fully understand, it can be very hard to resolve some of those impairments. But so you've got basically train state, injury to here and then you kind of just go down a little bit more then you have a surgery you know like it's just another trauma and now you're really trying to work back from a, a far ways down is the way i'll say it and so one of the things that we've talked about is can we do more preoperative intervention like after your injury but before your surgery can we try to get you as strong as you as we can and kind of get your system working again so at least you're kind of like working back up a little bit before you're going to get this other hit from the surgery when you when you are looking at ACL injuries and you're talking about osteoarthritis in the knee, do you follow any of these student athletes long term to determine if that hip asymmetry ends up in early hip osteoarthritis? That's a great question. Um, that is a great question. Thanks for the question. So it's it's a, and I say it because it's a really you want to review it. Thank you. Sorry, I was thinking the mic. Um, the question was after the ACL type injuries, not only are we, you know, are we seeing the the differences in the um, potential arthritis at the knee, but at the other joints, right? At the hip, because we know there are some changes that occur there, are we also seeing uh, arthritic changes there? I would say it's understudied. We don't really know yet. Most of the focus has been on the knee. All of the data that I was kind of like that paper that I showed, that was from like a year and a half ago, I want to say. It's all pretty new information because the imaging techniques are really improving for being able to kind of quantify the, the cartilage health at each joint. Um, so I haven't really seen any long-term data on that, but it's, it's a really interesting question and it's something that people are, are, are starting to study more. So one of the individuals that we've you know, kind of started to partner with or talk, uh, talk with is a professor at Marquette University. 
and his whole kind of uh, funded research lab is more about the long term, like what happens after you, you retire from sport. These high level athletes where they've had this significant load, they all have all these injuries and then then what happens, you know, and that's definitely one of the you know aims of his his work and it will be very interesting to see but it, it's hard to say I, we haven't seen it to the extent for sure that the knee that we have at the knee but i really don't know beyond that thank you just have a question regarding you have the triangle in terms of physical therapy like when you did this comparison, was it physical therapy like daily, weekly, bi weekly, or and did that really affect the results or could they improve those results? Gotcha. So the, the question was related to the physical therapy that our athletes were receiving, specifically the people that I showed the, the radar plot for of the hip, knee, and ankle. Um, and were they getting you know regular physical therapy? Was it daily, weekly, and, and how could that influence the results? So honestly, that's one of the interesting things about this is that's collegiate athletes, right? They have great resources, you know, like they can come into the training room every day, right? Like, and that's what they typically do early on. That's not necessarily our standard outpatient clinical care, right? For ACL it's more like maybe two times a week early on after surgery. And then later on one time a week because insurance won't, you know, compensate at that level. Um, but, but a collegiate athlete is a different situation. So I would say that, you know, they, they do have a volume of care that is much greater than your typical patient. Um, it is hard for me to say anything about quality of care necessarily. Um, I, we have tried to implement, you know, a number of these strategies based on things that we've seen. So we will be able to determine going forward <laughs> if our results improve. Then we can say, hey, you know, we're seeing, you know, we're seeing better results. You know, the things that we have changed. You know, we're, we are doing a better job of treating these individuals. Hopefully, that is what we'll we'll see. Um, but it's hard for me to kind of say anything about the quality of, of the care. This brings up a, an interesting point. Like one of the challenges to this is that, you know, like I can't do a randomized. We can't do a, a you know a typical experiment would be randomize people, right? Like maybe take half of those people and be like, hey, I'm gonna train them this way and half train them that way and see who gets better. You can't do that with our athletes, right? Like I have zero ability to do any kind of randomized trials with the athletes. It's all kind of more observational because if we think that this way of training is better, they should all be doing that, right? Like I can't really study it as well in that population. So that's where it gets a little harder. Yeah. Do your student athletes have any, or have you looked for, any limb length discrepancies? And does that affect how they heal from this kind of thing? The question was, do the student athletes that we've studied have limb length discrepancies? And does that influence you know, healing or any of the differences that we see? Um, we do measure limb length regularly because all the athletes undergo body composition scans as well. That's part of kind of our standard testing process. Um, actually, because there's another area of study, we've really started to see some interesting differences in bone mineral density of the involved leg. That we're actually seeing some changes in the distal femur, um, again, even years after injury. So some other effects that weren't necessarily anticipated, but we have not seen any consistent differences in limb length of the individuals that we're studying or really any indication that that strongly influences the, the results that we're seeing. If someone had a more significant limb length discrepancy coming into it, I would expect that to influence their baseline results, but not necessarily as much the effect of the injury. Thanks. So, so you had, uh, you mentioned that you have some pre injury data on some athletes. Do you ever use, or is there any evidence to say that you can use that for predictive and also potentially preventative? Um, so that's the first part. Right. And also, I imagine that since you can't bring everyone into your lab for multiple hours to, to check these things, is there any sort of like wearable technology that athletes or full teams can wear? Great questions. So, so the first question was, um, you know, based on the pre-injury data that we collect, is there anything that can be used kind of to almost as like injury prevention data or, or things that could relate to, to the injury risk or injury occurrence? 
And then second was, you know, just from a efficiency standpoint or maybe feasibility standpoint, um, is there anything from a wearable standpoint that we could instrument these individuals with rather than always coming into the lab for, for these types of collections or could get that type of information on the field of play? So to the first question, I mean, that's something that's been really uh, uh, intensely studied, I'll say, because one of the approaches to this is, wow, these injuries are bad, right? Like long-term sequelae, real bad. But what we should do is just prevent them, right? Like that'd be the best, right? If you could just prevent the injury from happening, that'd be the best situation for everybody involved. Um, unfortunately, that's very challenging, um, what we found. The best evidence that's out there is basically if you are doing training uh, programs to teach people during their developmental stages how to move, how to land, how to cut, to do this in a way where they're controlled, where they're using kind of deeper knee flexion angles so that the, you know, the knee isn't as much as that much risk for injury. This is, I'm talking, the best evidence is probably like 13 to 14 year olds um, with a pretty kind of consistent training program for months at a time, basically. And the best evidence is in the adolescent females. Um, and that's been a target because female ACL injury risk tends to be a little bit higher than males for certain sports or in certain age groups like that. So that's oftentimes been the target for those injury prevention programs. So there is some success there, but the question is, how many can we actually prevent? So if you look at those training programs and you say, you know, how many people do you have to put through a training program to prevent one injury? The answer is like 90. <laughs> you know, it's basically like 90 people have to complete three months or, you know, six months of training to prevent one injury. So it's just, you know, can you prevent the contact ones? You know, can you prevent the ones where, um, you know, where someone slips or their foot gets stuck or, you know, there's just so many things that you might not be able to change you know, that, that I'm not sure you're, you're, you have to much to gain, right. By doing all those other things. So I'd say there's definitely some evidence there, you know, some benefit, but by the time you get to collegiate athletes, yeah, I would argue that it's just, you're not going to change much. You know, the way someone moves, like the way I, I, you know, our basketball players, the way they jump and land when they shoot, we're probably not going to change that at this point, right. They've been doing that that way for, you know, 12, whatever years we're probably not going to change how they land at this point. Um, and so that's likely kind of a losing game. But if you could prevent it, that is probably the best. It's just, it's, it's not a great success rate. Um, and then to answer your second question, yeah. So this is one of the things I thought about putting in here. You know, it's all lab-based stuff, right? You got to come into the lab. You got to do everything like that. Um, the wearables or the ability to do this stuff on the field of play is improving. So there is markerless motion capture, which is very similar uh, in the output, the end output to what we get in the lab, but you're not outfitting them with all these reflective markers. And obviously you don't need cameras capturing this. You do need video cameras. Um, and based on a you know, pretty, um, uh, let's say complicated modeling approach, you're able to calculate the, you know, the joint angles and whatnot just by the use of these various video cameras. So that has been in the works for quite some time. It's kind of like the accuracy, you know, wasn't great initially. It's getting better and better. Um, we're starting to do more of that on the field of play, but we're definitely not at the point where we would like move on from the lab stuff yet. Um, but it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's starting to get there. <laughs> Thanks for the questions. I'm gonna take you out of the better habits that you've been talking about. How come I can't run as fast as I can? <laughs> <laughs> No, Do you want me to answer that? Is yeah. it muscle, muscle of skeletal or is it lung or my heart function is probably is pretty good. So uh, yeah. So what's the all of the above. So a aging is is kind of different, right? Like they're they're just okay. So from a musculoskeletal standpoint, there are you know um, aging related changes in your uh, your neural activation, in your muscle mass, in your rate of activation, or your ability to to drive the system. And we know that all those things change with age. Um, cardiovascular changes with age are also pretty well understood in terms of cardiovascular capacity. So I'd say the combination of both of those two things is going to, you know, influence your running performance as you age. If it's just a speed thing, that's actually probably more on the musculoskeletal side of things than the cardiovascular side of things. 
but anything with a you know more endurance aspect would be the cardiovascular side of things. Um, the good news is that at any age, <laughs> training will improve your you know muscle function, um, and your you know you can still let's say you might not gain muscle mass like someone you know of a younger age does, but you can still improve your strength just based on the neural changes. But what about the angles? Mm. Oh, how do those change? Gotcha. Gotcha. So I don't know off the top of my head. Um, I would have to, I would have to reference that. I'm not sure if there's a big difference in that, but they might be more cha uh, changed just based on stride length changes. So then if you have a shorter stride length, you're, you're looking at uh, changes in all the hip, knee and ankle an angles just based on that. You would see reductions in all of those. It's kind of the same as just a change in speed, basically. But if we we're comparing at the same speed and seeing that change, yeah, you just see less motion would be my guess. Yeah. Thanks. So, so more just so I understand the question, like more so people who are already kind of at the apex of their career in their sport at a young age. Yeah, as far as that's the way to put it, as far as I know, that's the earliest apex in athletics at a high level. Right. And how does that shift your analysis to what you do, if at all? Yeah, um, I would say that's an interesting question. You know, if it relates, if we're relating that to to ACL injury. You know, those, the, the risk in those sports wouldn't be as high as what we typically see. I mean, gymnastics, you could reasonably, you know, say is that that would be a potential risk for that type of knee injury, but we don't see it to the rates that we do in some of the other sports that I mentioned. So specific to ACL injury, I'm not sure you would do as much different, um, but yeah, there's definitely, uh, a very different thing looking at at someone at that age who is you know let's say kind of at the peak of their their athletic career in their sport versus someone who's a developing athlete i think anybody of that age can benefit from training on how to move right like how to land how to how to move in gymnastics those in those athletes may be a little bit ahead of that game just because they have been doing those types of activities for a period of time leading up to that. But they could still benefit if there is any, you know, the way they're moving, if there's any kind of uh, increased risk based on the way they're landing or the way they're pushing off, they could still benefit from, from training to try to improve that. Yeah, hip, hip and pelvis is generally considered lower extremity. So kind of in between. That's kind of no man's land. No, but uh, <laughs> but spine spine related research is kind of its whole. I'll say just kind of like its whole separate area. Um, so we have done some spine related investigations and kind of quantification of of spine motion um, in partnership with with some of the spine surgeons here. Um, but that is is I'd say kind of not doesn't necessarily fall under one or the other when i'm thinking upper extremity that is primarily like shoulder shoulder elbow uh wrist and hand yeah i was wondering uh, could you discuss uh, these marker lights that you mentioned earlier uh, what are they comprised of and how do they work exactly yeah so it's 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 the question was about the the marker lights for motion capture so it's really just a um uh, a small uh, globe-shaped, you know, object uh, 
um, on a rubber base, which can be affixed to the skin to like a, you know, a, a medically safe tape, basically a tape designed for that. Um, and all it is is reflective tape that is kind of around that globe shape that is, um, you know, that allow that the camera picks up. It, it's a passive motion cam motion uh, capture system. So the camera is detecting that reflection from the marker. So actually what you have to do when we do these collections, you know, people's running shoes have reflective uh, components, right? You can run at night, so it's safe. We actually have to tape over those things with duct tape and cover all other reflective markers. And if you have clothing with reflect, you can't wear that because yes, then you'll get a bunch of additional, you know, garbage data into the system. Um, but that's, that's basically what it is. You're just anything reflective is then being captured by the cameras. Well, well, the vital duct tape for sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> hey, anybody, right? There's always a vital roll for, for duct tape. The, the older systems were actually active systems that just switched. Basically, the things that you put on someone's body, you turn it on. It was like a power. It was an actual light. And then the camera was was uh, you know was was observing it that way. But we've this this is this system, the current system is much easier. You know, if you don't have to provide power <laughs> to all the markers you're putting on someone, it can just be a passive system and then the camera will capture the position. So you don't have to use LEDs anymore. No, yeah, right. That would be the older yeah. I'm kind of wondering with all the motion I get it off. Absolutely. So the, the question was about using the motion capture um, for uh, conditions like cerebral palsy, um, you know, where there's some significant abnormalities and, and to help identify deficits that could be targeted. And yeah, the answer is absolutely. This, you know, I gave the example of this is most of the research that I focus on athletic performance or, you know, our UW athletes just because of the types of injuries that I primarily study. But absolutely, this technology is used for those types of conditions. The lab, um, we used to have a lab space. Well, there still is lab space over at Research Park, kind of on the west side of town. Um, that's where that kind of older treadmill running video came from. There was a partnership with uh, pediatric uh, data analysis there for quite some time as well, um, and a lot of that going on. So we'd actually have, we'd have some of the, the kids come in and do that. I just wasn't as much involved in that research, but many of our uh, pediatricians and some of our other researchers were. So yeah, it can get a lot of you know, valuable information, really objective information about the movement patterns in a variety of conditions. Um, it just tends to be pretty common in athletics. I'll put it that way. Okay. What kind of sports do you play? <laughs> so, so I did not have any uh, any ACL. It's funny I asked that because it's just like uh, physical therapy applications. You know, are all like, when did you get interested in physical? Well, I injured my knee, and then I, you know, and everybody has that history. So. You know, like a fourth of our class every incoming class every year is like ACL injuries. Um, but uh, no, I, I did not necessarily have any se severe significant injuries growing up. I played basketball, cross country track um, were probably my, my primary sports. Racquetball wasn't a school sport, but I enjoyed it nonetheless. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, that's what I spent the most time on. These days, I, I still try to play basketball. <clears throat> try um and uh it's getting harder um and uh running occasionally uh weight training and, and water skiing is what i do the most um but uh yeah i no major injuries necessarily for me from that perspective but every one that i have is a learning experience <laughs> um and that's always always interesting as well to to kind of approach it from um from that angle um but i just say i got interested in physical therapy just based on, you know, I think like a lot of people I went to college and I was like, well, I like health sciences, like I go to med school. Um, and then I really didn't know much about physical therapy until I started taking some kinesiology courses, like almost into my third year. And I was like, wow, this is what I want to do. So just kind of found it that way. So, yeah. One more. You mentioned that the um, ACL was innovative 
So there's some communication between within the ACL and everything else. So where what kind of communication is occurring yeah. along that nerve, those those nerves yeah. in the ACL? So it's 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 sensory you know information. So it's it's basically providing information to the brain about joint position, sense of the knee. So this is one of the you know the major problems like when you you know after someone you know lacks an ACL or has an ACL rupture or whatever even if they are back to the point where they're you know walking again or whatever before surgery you know they may have significant instability not only because of structurally the knee is less stable but they have their brain is less um, able to know where their knee is in space. So kind of like, you know, think of like after an ankle sprain, you know, you, you kind of you know, feel a little more wobbly on that leg. Part of it's structural, but part of it's also the neural aspect of things. There's damage to the sensory nerves in that area, and it's harder for you to voluntarily control it. This has been a huge area of study recently. There's basically the idea that peripheral joint injury causes more changes to the brain than we initially thought. So a lot of advanced imaging MRI type studies basically see that in people with an ACL injury or ACL reconstruction, there's a lot more brain activity to accomplish simple tasks. So like for me, as someone with an intact ACL to balance, you know, requires a minimal amount of whatever input or, or you know, uh, output, but for someone lacking an ACL injury, they maybe need more focus, right? Or they need a, a greater amount of activity. And one of the things that we've seen, it relates to vision people become visually dominant. So if you allow them to keep their eyes open and look at something like they can balance pretty well, but now you remove the vision from it and they have to rely more on that sensory input and their, their function is really uh, diminished. So it's an interesting idea for sports performance because during your sport, there's a bunch of things going on. You can't focus on just how you're controlling your knee. You know, you have to respond to opponents. You have to to um, make quick decisions. So anyway, thanks, that's an interesting question. Does the, uh, does the orthopedic work extend to the dance department and folks in the dance? So I would say, and the question was, does the does the this orthopedic work extend to dance and people in dance? So I'll just, I'll just say this from a UW athlete perspective, we do work with with spirit or or the cheer, you know, squats. Like if they have these injuries, they're part of athletics. We do uh, evaluate and, and provide treatment to them as well. Um, in, in relation to you know other aspects of dance, I would say. I, you know, there are people in my field who absolutely, that is their expertise, you know, that is more um, focused on dance and, and, uh, you know, aspects related to performance in that area. Our lab doesn't do as much outside of UW athletics, so I wouldn't say much more than that, but we are involved with those, those teams as well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't know. I just don't know if there's a group that has has partnered with them for study in the past or not. There, there are you know related to one of the earlier questions. Um, we do have investigators in ortho rehab who have done a lot of work with like bone mineral density in, in female athletes in different areas. And I know that there's been a lot of work with like gymnastics, and there may have been some in, in, with dance too. But I just I can't remember the details of that as well. So yeah. Thank you very much. Really appreciate. It. Yeah. Thank you. That'd be a great follow-up. That'd be maybe it'll be really interesting after this. Yeah.